Hello, this is Dr. Marty Klein with another video quickie. You know, every week I work with people who have cheated or have been cheated on. As long as there have been committed couples, there has been infidelity. Broken vows of sexual exclusivity is a recurring theme in Greek tragedy, the Bible, medieval literature, Shakespeare, Victorian potboilers, and the modern tales of Alfred Hitchcock, Frank Sinatra, and Taylor Swift. Survey data regarding cheating keeps changing as social definitions of cheating evolve, and the invention of cars, telephones, and the internet, not to mention mixed gender schools and workplaces, have multiplied people's opportunities for a broader range of physical and emotional relationships. Infidelity is one of the top reasons people see a therapist, either alone or with a partner. I do believe that I've heard every possible reason for it, every possible excuse for it, and every possible reaction to it. Most people think they know something about infidelity as a general subject, but when it actually occurs in someone's life, they need to shed their common myths very quickly. So let's challenge some common myths about infidelity right now. Number one, a vigilant partner can prevent their partner's infidelity. Is your mate going to cheat? It's less likely if your relationship is enjoyable, your mate is healthy, the two of you can talk about everything, and the sex is satisfying. But even then, you cannot guarantee someone's fidelity. Some partners try, of course. They examine their mate's mobile phone, records of texting, geolocators, email, and actual phone calls. Or they tell their partner, no one-on-one -on -one dinners with any one of the other sex. Or they demand to check in on a partner at will. When all else fails, they might even hire a private detective. None of this works. If your mate is going to cheat, they're going to cheat. And even if you could prevent infidelity with the right amount of surveillance, is that how you want to live? Well, here's another myth, that infidelity is always about sex. While different, better, or more sex is the reason for some infidelity, people cheat for other reasons, including anger, a need to prove that they're attractive or youthful, the need for affection or touching, the need to feel loved, and the need to prove their autonomy. There's also a situational dynamic for some people. I wasn't looking for it, but when it fell in my lap, I just couldn't say no or I didn't want to say no. When a spouse discovers that they've been betrayed, they often imagine that it's been for someone who's younger, sexier, or more attractive in one way or another. Then they're surprised when the other woman or the other man isn't. What betraying spouses often tell me is that the central benefit of the affair was feeling listened to or important or sane rather than amazing sex. Myth number three, some people are just sex addicts. Some people who cheat over and over are responding to a diagnosable mental health problem. They may be medicating their depression or managing their anxiety or expressing bipolar disorder or OCD. Cheating may be the way a person with borderline personality disorder navigates stressful life situations. I'm very sympathetic for people who have so much trouble dealing with their emotions. Therapy is usually helpful, and for many, medication has added benefits. But addiction is a state in which a person's body has seized control of their decision-making. Heroin and nicotine are good examples of addictive substances. When people describe themselves or someone else as a sex addict, though, they usually mean someone who keeps making sexual decisions whose consequences they don't like. Why do people do that? Typically because they don't want to face life without the deception, self-indulgence, and denial that would stop protecting them from realities they don't want to face. Repetitive promise breaking may look like addiction, but it's typically just a desperate attempt to avoid the consequences of keeping promises, whether those involve boredom, rage, hopelessness, despair about aging, or indeed a sexless relationship. Myth number four, it's always better to admit an affair. Well, it depends on what someone is trying to accomplish. If someone's goal is simply to rid themselves of guilt, that would be pretty selfish. 
assuming they end or have ended the affair without any ripple effects. Of course, if an affair is discovered by the betrayed partner, it's generally better to acknowledge it, as more lying and a cover-up typically make things messier, and that usually fails. The betrayed partner can also use the additional cover-up as evidence that the cheater can't be trusted in the future, which makes eventual reconciliation almost impossible. Opening the subject of having, ending, or considering an affair can be a powerful way to start a conversation about wanting to improve a relationship. It certainly will get a partner's attention. Now here's uh, a myth that Oprah just loves. Once a cheater, always a cheater. Now, surveys do estimate that someone who has cheated before is three times more likely to cheat again compared to people who have never cheated. On the other hand, my clinical experience is that many cheaters are themselves devastated by the outcome of their affairs discovery. Whether because of their partner's grief, their own sense of shame, or both, many cheaters are shocked into fidelity. Well, first they're shocked, then they have to go through a process, therapy or a spiritual awakening or a dark night of the soul. If they emerge with a new understanding of themselves or of intimacy or of betrayal, they're then in a position to really commit to fidelity. Some of the best marriages around are eventually built that way. And here's another myth. Marriage can't survive infidelity. Well, if that were true, marriage would be a poor gamble and marriage counseling would be a poor investment. Well, there are two kinds of relationships that survive infidelity. In the first, communication is poor, expectations are low, there's family or cultural pressure to stay together, there may be financial or other kinds of dependence. This is a relationship that wasn't very good to begin with. People in these relationships, they just keep limping along feeling trapped. If one of these couples comes to therapy, they usually drop out after two or three sessions. Now, the second kind of relationship that survives infidelity is almost the opposite of the first. In it, people work hard to understand what happened and why. They're introspective to some degree. And at some point, they start listening to each other. They eventually talk about what they want in the new couple that they're in the process of creating. Working with those people is a lot of work, but it can also be thrilling. When they succeed, it affirms my belief in the power and the value of relationships. Well, thanks for joining me. I'm Dr. Marty Klein. By the way, I uh, publish one of these video quickies every few weeks. So if you want to get notified when I do, just click the subscribe button down there and you'll get pinged whenever I drop a new one. Thanks.